This episode is brought to you by Modal Electronics, who enable you to play and perform powerful sound with their incredible synthesizers. You can enjoy vibrant wavetable patches with the Argon 8 series, or you can produce with state-of-the-art analog-style synth textures with the Cobalt 8 series. To check out Modal Electronics' incredible array of synthesizers, go to modalelectronics.com. Modal Electronics. Dare to sound different. Music is, uh, is, is, is my whole family. <laughs> and, and, and also music, my favorite singer-songwriter happens to be a relative, and he is my favorite singer-songwriter. He's uh, out of this world. So it plays a big part in my life to answer your question. Sure. And, and so who is your, what's the name of your favorite singer-songwriter, and uh, what, what relation is he to you? Keaton, K-E-A-T-O-N, Keaton Simons, S-I-M-O-N-S. And uh, he's my wife's oldest son. And um, he's my stepson. He's my pal. Wow. And I have listened to his music, and his music is fantastic. Um, but how, how did everything start for Keaton? Well, it kind of started organically. He, uh, he loves music, and he grew up always fiddling with it. And then he became serious, but it was like a very serious hobby. And then he went away to school. Uh, he went to Evergreen up in Washington State. And uh, when he came back from school, there was no holding him back. He had a band, he did his thing. He played every weekend and uh, played for people all the time. And then slowly, slowly got a following and became the, the incredible musician, singing, songwriting guy he is. Is that over condensed? No, it's pr that's pretty good. May <laughs> I add to it, Tom? Is that okay? Of course, of course. So, you know, there's a lot of um, genetics when it comes to art and being an artist, music, acting. Look at Eric and his family and our family. And actually, it was very interesting because um, Keaton had this weird gift because uh, I play classical piano. And um, he, when he was two years old, could imitate if he heard if I played like four bars of even Rachmaninoff or Scarlatti he could play it so if I went four bars at a time he could master the entire piece and he didn't learn to read music till he was 20 years old yeah. so That's he went and everything and it was hard to find a teacher he decided he wanted to learn to read so he could master a Chopin piece for his grandmother and uh, we finally found a teacher who was willing to start him at his very advanced level um, she'd had one other student like that, which was her own son. But he um, he then wanted to play guitar. He he just loved the music that we loved, and um, and he has a degree from Evergreen in ethnomusicology. So uh, it's just a weird, just a weird instinctive kind of connection, something way deep. And he's got this uh, this uh, writing gene, his DNA, and that right. his uh, his grandfather, his uh, his. Uh, his uh, maternal grandfather uh, was an Academy Award winning writer. Yeah. Wow. So he's got it. He's got it in his genes. But so learning to read age 20 is very late. So was he already very advanced to actually playing music by that stage? Very advanced. Let me turn off my notifications there because they're going to they're going to interfere with us. If I can figure out how to do that, then let's see, which I think I can. <laughs> One second. Messages, preferences kill that sound there we go yay Thank you, um Matthew. he um in answer to your question he was extremely advanced he there was nothing he couldn't play um he wouldn't agree with that but i mean he knew music theory he knew he was really advanced so, but he just wanted to um since there was no one who could play the chopin piece for him and he could learn the way he was used to learning he had to learn it by reading and he's good with languages too similar and he learned to read extremely fast because the logic of it just made sense to him and um and uh that was that was that it was pretty crazy no it's so, not using an abused word and she won't use it but he's a genius he's, he's like really gifted yeah it seems because obviously this a cynic might say you know is he really your your favorite singer songwriter but it seems so sincere so yeah. When did when did he gain that accolade though? 
uh, in your mind? When did he become your favorite singer-songwriter? Well, I'll tell you what it was. Uh, his mom, uh, we, we didn't have a CD player in the house. So his mom says, get in the car, I want you to hear something. And uh, uh, he, he, he had done these, uh, these tracks on a little, little, little disc. And we ride around in the car and she plays it for me. And it blew me away. I was blown away. I had, I had yet to hear him live. I had, I, I'd been away for the better part of two years, except for pit stops at home. And uh, he, he'd been playing all these little clubs and stuff while I was gone. And then I come home and, you know, uh, I hear this music that uh, I became a fan of that day. And then, uh, and, then, and then he played his whole library for me and he became my favorite singer songwriter. I mean, I mean, first there was Cat Stevens, you know, then there was Jackson Brown and now there's Keaton Simons for me. And uh, those, those three guys are my favorite singer songwriters. And I happen to have one in my house a lot. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's everybody would like to have their favorite singer songwriter living with them. And that, you know, th there are some things uh, from those first two artists, Cat, Cat Stevens and Jackson Brown. You know, there's I, I don't know whether they're they're influences on Keaton, but there's some things that aren't a million miles away from that. So the first song that you've chosen by Keaton is yet uh, from which I think was released on his EP, because I listened to the whole EP, One, Two, Three, Go. Is that right? Was that on that? And um, why, why that song in particular? Well, I've got about six or eight of favorite Keaton songs. That's my most recent favorite favorite. Uh, uh, but I got lots of favorites. I, I don't really have a reason. It's just one of those songs that when I heard it, I went, oh my God. He wrote that song. <laughs> you know, I, I think with Yet, um, we always would talk about, we had a criteria. Uh, songs should make you either want to drive fast, make love, cry, dance, or sing along, right? And, you know, if it doesn't move you to one of those things where you just can't resist that activity, then, you know, for us, it would be, we'd skip it and go to the next. Yet is so emotional. And you know, you asked about the importance of music. As filmmakers, people in film, it's so important. We've seen all of our shows before they put the music in and mm. none of them are good at all. They're like horrible. You're like, oh my God, I can't ever mention to anybody that I did this. Doesn't matter how great it is. The second the music goes in, if it's well-selected, it turns into something beautiful. It's music is maybe the number one most important element of filmmaking before the director, the script, the actors, almost anything. And yet is extremely filmic. So, you know, it, it evokes almost all of that criteria. Um, it's so emotional. Well, for me, talking about music is like talking about an acting moment. You can't really do it, you gotta let it be. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, and in terms of uh, Keaton's performances, uh, have you been to many of his gigs? Me? Both of you. Only about 10 million, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Tom, you have to look on YouTube and um, say, type in something like Eric Roberts at a Keaton Simons show or something. <laughs> Dude, Eric I... is so funny at the shows. I've been to so many and people... <laughs> It's, I've been to the ones in the grungy clubs where you can't even use the restroom and, you know, you could die of secondhand smoke and, and, you know, no mom should actually be there. And, you know, people will say to Keaton, your mom's here, you know, you sure you really want her here? Yeah, his <laughs> grandmother was there till she passed at 94 years old and she's in our business and she was very, she loved him, but very critical, always in the audience with her old friends. And then there'd be teen teenagers there. But Eric is so vocal and so emotional and so he dances and yells and cries and, and, you know, everybody, you know, it's almost distracting. It's so funny. I mean, I can see Keaton from stage sometimes being like, dude, I love your support, but, uh, <laughs> um, well, we, we, uh, uh, he always knows I have kind of, kind of signature noise. So I, I go, yeah, really loud. And, uh, and I will see him smile sometimes, like, oh, there he is. Yeah, he loves it. One thing that was really adorable to one of your earlier questions, Tom, was Keaton didn't believe me that Eric was as familiar as he was with his songs. Um, I, I mentioned to him, I was like, 
he can sing along to anything. I mean, this guy has so many lines of dialogue in his head, but he learns songs really well. And <laughs> Keaton was like, yeah. And then they were doing a show together for VH1. And, um, and so Keaton had to play as part of the show. And Eric was sitting on the lawn somewhere and Keaton, uh, it was the first time Keaton realized out of the corner of his eye, he saw Eric mouthing every word to like 20 songs. <laughs> and he was like, oh my God, you weren't even making that up. He's like, dude, you know all my songs. I'm so no, honored. He, he is my favorite singer songwriter, and not because I love the guy, but because his words and the and the and the I mean, and the music. Oh my God! And the guitar playing. Oh my God! It's endless. The guy is just phenomenal, and and I'm not even biased saying that. That's just a fact. Wait till you. He's his, heard his he's, music. I've heard it. I think I do. I do think he's extremely talented. But one thing I must ask is, how's he been coping with the pandemic in the sense of live performances and being in the music industry? Because it is, it's a tricky time, isn't it? Yeah, um, it's rough on on anybody who's a performer. But, uh, but he was over was there happy. with you, Tom. You, yeah. you you would have. Okay, so Keaton took a job. Um, Brett Young who is very, very popular here. And I, you know, I'm not sure if you know him, you can look him up and he's doing really, really well, kind of a late bloomer. And Keaton and Brett uh, came through the ranks together in, in LA and Brett broke through in country music. He kind of, he's not actually a country musician, but he went into country, I mean, can do it, into country music to kind of, you know, break in, it worked. And so, they called one day and asked Keaton if he could recommend anybody who could even come close to his guitar playing skill as a lead guitar. And Keaton was like, what about me? And they were like, no, come on. And he's like, no, I'd love to do that. That would be so much fun. So he became Brett's lead guitar player and they do a lot of Keaton songs in the set and everything too. Huh. And they were on a European tour, sold out arena stadium tour. Yeah. And they actually were um, in either in the UK or in Ireland they were, they'd completed three quarters of the tour and the pandemic hit and they were 16 minutes from going on stage and they were instead put in cars, brought to the airport and sent back to the US. Yeah, I closed God. that door. Right, and they have just started, they've done a few virtual shows. Um, they're shooting a music video. Keaton's done some of his own stuff and he's done a lot of acting during this time also. Tell him about, about the Diane Keaton movie. But he, he also scored scored well that was right before pandemic though he did has nine songs and he's in and he also scored along with noah needleman who's one of the band in, in with brett um love weddings and other disasters the diane keaton jeremy irons movie oh right um, wow and directed but that's but, cool um, yeah, yeah with cool. l king he did a bunch of music with l king which is fabulous but keaton um oh he's a comer man he's, he's a total comer. he they just did a show in texas they just got back on their tour bus they're doing a huge festival in Palm Springs. They're just starting to get back to touring. It, it's been a shocker and very weird, but they've made the most of it and they've been very busy. Closed down society for us. Yeah. That's, uh, that's really interesting that he's playing guitar. Uh, you know, he's Brett Young's lead guitarist because Brett Young is pretty huge, isn't he? Yes. Um, how, but how is that with, you know, pursuing his own career as a singer-songwriter, because that is, it's its a tricky thing. Does he does he resent being... Uh, well, Brett, doing Brett that? Has, known, has known Keaton for, for, for well over a decade now, and they're, they're like very close, and they grew up together in the industry. So Brett, you're very aware of, of, like, of like Keaton's monster talent, and he actually highlights a bunch of Keaton songs on the tour. I mean, I mean, they're... They're they're all but partners, you know. Brett's Brett's the headliner, Keaton's lead guitar, but but they're they're all but partners. I mean, you know. It's an excellent question, also, and what Eric said is true. But um, very interesting, you should ask, because of course, you know, when you're coming up, you support each other. But it's very, you know, it definitely gets to you in every way. One person gets a little further ahead, or whatever. Um, it depends on how you define success, of course. Mm. He, um, his feeling about it, he doesn't feel at all resentful. He's very thrilled for Brett. He's able to compartmentalize early in his career when he was on Maverick Records and he was represented by the Hits Magazine guys and the Hervé Zoff company. Um, he was offered to play lead guitar for Nika Costa, I think it was. And they, half of them said, do it. You know, we'll balance your stuff, right? Um, but Nika had said, 
during the year you're with me, you've got to just do that. And the other people on his label at Warner Brothers were like, you can't do this because we're working on your career. It takes so much money and so much to launch an artist, so much time. So much investment. That, okay. you know, in a way, the work ethic is if you have a job and it's a job in, in music, you know, embrace it. And he so loves the other people in the band. Look, my mom and David Duchovny, who does music with Keaton and has known him since he was a child, he watches the shows and he loves Brett. My mom loved Brett. Both of them have said that should be Keaton up there standing. You know, it's weird, you know, because they're so used to Keaton being the one. Um, Keaton has managed, if there are any of those feelings at all, he has managed them and can keep it all in place and be really happy. He loves his job there and it has not precluded the other. Ben Caver, who wrote a lot of Brett's hits with Brett, also wrote an incredible song called Masterpiece with Keaton and Josh Kelly. So, you know, in that world, it's just such a wonderful mix of incredibly talented people. And I think if, they're, if they manage to get to modify their dreams a little so that they can um, be grateful and appreciative and enjoy what they have instead of think, comparing it to something. Yeah. It's a good thing to do in life in general. Well, it's a, it's a healthy uh, attitude to have, but I mean, I can only imagine that in entertainment, particularly in music, there's definitely a high degree of competition uh, out there. But, you know, Brett Young's music is, is great, but, you know, I, I'm not uh, pulling your leg. I do prefer Keaton's uh, music and his tunes and, and, and his style, but I can also see the appeal of going out and playing big arenas. So, you know, it's. I think there are many people who would... Uh, you know, give their left limbs to uh, to be in Keaton's position either way. That, that's for sure. Uh, so I, I wanted to ask about the covers that you've chosen um, because there's a, a cover that Keaton does of In the Air tonight. Um, why why did why did that speak to you so much? Uh, a, a cover version, and do, you know, do you like the original? Right. Great, great question. Um, we love the use of the original in Risky Business. We love the original and um, all along the Watchtower. Say, wait, is it all along the Watchtower that he does? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, he was asked to do those for certain projects, and they wanted something that wasn't an interpretation. They wanted a real cover, very similar to the original. So for him, it was a very he honored the original by really learning all those licks and everything, and they're great placement worthy stuff. He's had a lot of songs and a lot of movies and TV shows and commercials. He's all over television. So um, so they're very useful because there will be some music supervisor who needs those songs, can't afford the original. Um, and so the reason I chose those for you in particular or that we chose those for you in particular was just because they're, you know, there are two very separate things. He's got hundreds of original songs. The dichotomy. Yeah. Yeah, but the the mus the musicianship and vocals used for those particular covers, um, it's great to spread that around. I mean, they they the people who asked him to do those would really like them to be heard. So that's the other reason we wanted to like have that be part of the discussion with you. And also, I'm a I'm a Hendrix groupie, so <laughs> yeah, a big Hendrix fan. I mean, yeah. he he is one of one of the all time greats. But so nowadays, though, in music, because you're saying Keith has done a lot uh, for film and TV, is that one of the the great things to do in terms of finding your feet, uh, being able to actually, you know, make a living uh, and be successful as a musician? Because you know, Spotify and all the other streaming companies, God knows great. what the situation is. Uh, it, there's probably excessive press coverage about how how the music industry is broken a little bit. So is that is that the sort of one of the only last things that you can do? You can get your it's a big outlet. It's a big outlet, and it's also a great place to have your stuff heard, to have your stuff bought, because oh, who's that? You know, and uh, they respond to it, and they and and they can they can find out who you are very easily. Do you, um, you have a lot of musicians who listen to your show I, uh, at different stages of their career, I'd imagine. Absolutely. It's a wonderful question. All your questions are so great, Tom. Um, <laughs> Thank you. For a minute, they were saying TV is the new radio. 
when Grey's Anatomy, when Alexandra um, Patsavas, who's a big music supervisor, mm, a started big songs to close an episode or whatever, um, she was launching bands that way who yeah. had struggled for years. Launching career. And, but, however, it doesn't always work. You can have a placement where it's background and you don't even hear it. You can have a placement that just doesn't, it doesn't have as much emotional impact or it gets people interested for a second, but it doesn't last. But if it's an MOS um, montage, for instance, and it's and you get emotionally that song makes the scene work for you, it can totally break an artist or at least break a song. And a perfect example, Keaton's had tons of placements, Sons of Anarchy, this one, that one. So um, tell, tell him about suits. Well, that's what I'm going to tell him. So, but what happened was on Suits, Eric did nine episodes of Suits, around nine episodes, whatever, give or take a few. Um, and um, we were trying, you know, several people were trying to get a Keaton song in there. They're inundated with songs. Everybody in the cast had friends who had a song, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know. <laughs> and after it takes, you have to squeeze a hundred trees worth of lemons to get this much lemon juice, right? <laughs> after, you know, way before Eric hit, hit the show, after years of trying and submitting so many songs and they loved him. It just has to be a perfect melding of scene and song. And, you know, it's like casting. Um, finally, they chose his song, When I Go. Um, for the closing of a season with Meghan Markle. For Meghan Markle's and, exit. Yeah, where they're taking, no, it was <laughs> Mike. It was when they're taking Patrick, plays Mike, to jail. And oh, so right. everyone in the cast is there. It's extremely emotional. There's no dialogue practically. And you and hear the They whole play the song. whole song. And then they picked up the next season with the song. Yeah. So, it, okay. So people right. take Shazam and they hold up their phone. And we watched the numbers go up. Keaton was at his house with his girlfriend and we were at our house. Well, it was mind blowing yeah, um, because it was up on, on <laughs> YouTube. And then of course on Spotify and whatever. And we watched it. If, when it got to like 40, we we're like, wow, it's 40. Well, it's like almost 7 million now. And wow. that night, and it's kept on going. Now in terms of pay, you know, you can make, $45,000 for a placement, or you can, they place it gratis. You can make $45 for a placement. You can't count on that to earn a living. Yeah, for sure. You know, you on the publishing, you get your ASCAP or BMI. Um, the other place where he did really well was on Celebrity Rehab when Keaton was a visitor and he played on the show live, um, his song Unstoppable. And people were sobbing and so emotionally involved in the story. The song became part of the story. And you know, just 45,000 downloads sold, but that was before you could get stuff for free so much yeah. Um, yeah. at night. So um, yes, it's a very helpful way to earn a living as a musician. It's really tough um, unless you have all kinds of sponsors, unless you're already Beyonce. I, I don't know. They used to say touring and merch. I don't know what well, they are. No, that's, that's there is no industry for the music industry. No. It's a shame. Yeah. No. Who knows what will what will fix it? How has the acting industry, how has the film industry been affected of late? Uh, have things paused? Is there going to be a glut of content on Netflix and all the other streaming services? Because, I mean, that really would be the final straw. Uh, that Then there really would be nothing to do. <laughs> uh, there, there, there's been threatened pauses three times. But there's only been slowdowns. There's there's actually been no pauses. We've we've all kept working. Uh, there's only been one set that I've been on that was a little dicey, a little, little and made me nervous. All the other sets are very smart, very very conscientious, very 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 mask wearing sets, and uh, everybody's very smart and careful. And have masks. We always have our mask. The thing is, Tom. Um, <clears throat> Eric saying that because we have chosen to keep working um, as best we can. Um, I think part of the reason that we've gotten and he's gotten some spectacular jobs, especially at this stage of the pandemic, is because there's still people who can afford to say no. Um, because uh, like Eric, I don't know when you're going to cut this together and when it's going to air, but um, it'll be pretty soon. 
Okay, so May so 6th, he, re he returns to Grey's Anatomy on May 6th. And, um, and that's a very big deal and very big for the storyline. He has two other things we're not allowed to announce yet, but you'll be one of the first to know as soon as we can. They're so cool, man. Um, wow. there's, and Keaton's music is involved in both of those projects as well. Wow. Um, but he's got some big things going on. Listen, our industry's a mess. It's it, the things that are terrible, they pay you for. It's like hazard pay. This may be, this may ruin your career. So here's a little money, right? And the things that are high quality, they're getting everybody for scale or less. Um, and uh, because they just don't have to pay. They, they really don't. I mean, again, if, if you're in that echelon where you can show up for a perfume or a, a, you know, a, a watch or a piece of jewelry, um, you know, you're going to make some money. But just as a regular old actor and people's prices and stuff, it's all over the place. And there actually has been the, the two projects that he's working on that we can't announce. Both of them were full steam ahead. They just started, they were filming and a week in, they were shut down for a year and a half because of COVID. Yeah. Oh my God. And yeah. A little over a year. And so we're, they're now resuming. So they, so it has had an effect, but just uh -huh. not, not brought it to the absolute standstill of touring. And you mentioned Grey's Anatomy and earlier Alexandra Pat Savas, because she was like uh, the music supervisor on the OC. So I, that's why I know that name. Cause that show was so good for, uh, for breaking all the indie bands. They broke the killers and everybody. Yep. Uh, so just she, the supervision on Grey's Anatomy as well. Yes, right. I, I think Alexandra um, created that entire phenomenon. And by yeah. the way, I think she might hate me because I was so unbelievably <laughs> constantly sending Pushy. her Keaton's music. Pushy. And then Shonda, <laughs> Shonda and Krista fell in love. Shonda Rhimes and Krista Vernoff fell in love with Keaton's music, which helped a little because all of a sudden, Alexandra, there's actually a, an episode of Private Practice, you know, the Grey's kind of spinoff, named after a Keaton song, uh, if I hadn't forgotten and um, and Kate Walsh sings the song and then it segues into Keaton's performance of the song. Um, but I drove Alexandra, she's very gracious to us, but we both drove her crazy. Um, but it's because she's, let's talk about a genius. She, the OC is a perfect example. Mm. That's just, she just made that thing happen. Yeah, she did. Incredible. She's well, so amazing. Was, Cause that was like, she's probably the most, in my mind, one of the most famous music supervisors in the sense that everybody was kind of Googling oh, who, who chooses the music on this show. But I mean, is she sort of, I mean, I'm, I'm imagining, I mean, she must be quite a big name in, in TV, but for, for movies and stuff, is there, are there music supervisors for movies who are just well, like, didn't, didn't if you're going to get this guy, that'd be amazing. Didn't she do Twilight? I think she picked ah, that. Ah, that's a yeah. good point. <laughs> but she, so she's for movies as well. She's everything. Yeah. Well, she, I know she's got a record label and, you know. Yeah, I mean, she kind of had to. I mean, she was so, it, it was, she was so responsible for so much success. And um, Michelle Silverman is another one, Sons of Anarchy, um, a lot of amazing shows that she's done. She's the other one who is passionate and breaks people. With Alexandra, part of the reason we were so persistent our attorney, Jeff Frankel, represents the creator of the OC also, and they're very good friends. And this was when everybody had CD players in their car. They were going to be driving to a convention for the OC. They were going to be driving to the OC. So it's like an hour drive from LA. And Jeff Frankel, who's a Keaton fan, was so excited. He had put together his own compilation of Keaton songs to play for Josh. And he was like, we'll get Keaton songs on the OC. I can't wait. And we left the records with him in the parking lot and we left, we snuck off, we couldn't wait, we're so excited. Josh gets there to meet with Jeff so they can drive. And Josh goes, let's take my car. And Jeff's like, okay. And he already had the CD in his tape deck. So he takes it out and you know, and he goes, there's some music I wanna play. Here's a CD. And Josh is like, oh man, I don't have a CD player. <laughs> and Jeff's like, this is a disaster. Yeah. And in those days, you couldn't just find it on iTunes and whatever, Josh, yeah. playlist. Josh still to this day has never heard Keaton's music. This was so devastating. Yeah, that must and, have been a terrible moment, right? that expectation. Well, yeah, but that's the thing in, in our business is you have these moments and they, they're they way too important one way or the other.
and they're so personal. That's why it's a personal business. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, does it get tiring? I mean, with everything that, that you do, uh, you know, and, and Keaton uh, pursuing music, uh, you being involved in the film industry and being involved in, in industries, entertainment industries, where it's a constant treadmill of getting you know, onto the next thing. It's not, it's definitely not, it's the antithesis to the stable nine to five. Uh, <laughs> yeah. That's for sure. Uh, and the, the, uh, many people think it's all glamorous and, you know, drinking champagne all day and, yeah, you know, looking <laughs> glamorous all the time, but it's actually uh, incredibly hard work and it must be emotionally taxing. Uh, do yeah. you, is, is that the case? To what extent is that the case? Well, okay, I'll say a little bit and then you have to say what you think. You ask the best questions. It's, it's amazing. It's like you're inside of our, our brains. Oh, um, thank you, Eliza. <laughs> I, so sure. I always say that our industry is probably no different than any other, teaching, banking, whatever, you know, construction. But most of our energy, focus, intelligence, time, and, and blood, sweat, and tears is self-promotion. It's all about getting the next job. And it never ends. You're paying your dues forever. You never can rest. And the truth is, um, that is very taxing. It you you really feel like you're sweating blood. Like it's it's so. What was it? What was the term we used for it earlier? I I, I can't even remember. But um, that that is a feature of our industry that it's kind of painful. And you, Keaton even said about Brett the other day. He said, you know, I always thought I I wanted that, but I see that ninety percent of his time is spent with these obligations of things that are really have nothing to do with music. They're not fun for him. Mm. And it's all to make sure that the next thing hits and that everybody gets their share. And, and, you know, that thing of feeling like a failure, if you only sell 1 million records as opposed to 5 million, I mean, those are factors that, um, yeah, that, that's where people kind of have a love hate relationship with our business, you know, for and sure. when we did the Rihanna video, she was going through that. We were doing Bitch Better Get, you know, Have My Money. And she was already worrying about the next song. We're like, you're Rihanna, aren't you? I mean, what? <laughs> She's like, oh, it never changes. She said, it never changes. What, what's your feeling about that? Oh, about all that, that part of it? Well, when you first uh, break into movies, m movies are a dream come true. And each movie is a new infant that you raise and you and you take care of and you potty train and you dress and you <laughs> and you show the world here's my infant and uh, it's very important to you <clears throat> then after you have 235 infants you yeah. stop you stop worrying about the fact they might have a dirty diaper it's like tough shit here we go <laughs> we're going and uh, yeah, everything becomes less precious even though it's the same blast, it's the same fun, it's the same headache, it's the same heartache, it's the same adventure, it's the same, oh my God, it's all the same, except for the fact it's not gonna break every time. And when you first start out, it's gonna break every day. Oh my God, it's gonna break. I have to be so, it's gonna break. This is breakable stuff. And that's how you spend your life for the first 10 years. But then you get through that and, uh, It'll be fine. We'll change. We'll change that diaper later. Come on, let's go. And you just you just move on. And uh, it becomes, it becomes like a marriage. It becomes. It's not a honeymoon, but it's what you live for. That's uh, that's an interesting way of looking at it. So you sort of settle down after a while, and you get the anxiety disappears. Well, I mean, I'm imagining that that would have had to happen in your case, Eric, because otherwise it would have been a pretty unpleasant uh, time for you over the last few decades, <laughs> given the fact you've got, from what I gather, over 600 credits. Is that true? Can you even rem remember all the things that you've been in? I lost count at 75. And I will, <laughs> I, will remember, I will remember if you point out somebody in it that I worked with. Oh yeah, right, that always comes back to me, always. But uh, as far as if you say, what about Roses Are Red? I'll say, yeah, it's a poem. No, it's the title of a movie. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. And I have no idea. <laughs> but uh, but uh, uh, I love what I do like I love my marriage. It's 
something that I thoroughly depend on, I thoroughly rely on, I thoroughly know it's going to be there. Same thing with my career. And, uh, you, you know, you know, maybe I'm foolish, but I just, I just love this, 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 this gift I've been awarded and mm. I follow in it a lot. It, is, is there a particular movie, uh, TV project or anything uh, in your quite enormous catalog of credits uh, that you're particularly uh, proud of? Well, since, as you pointed out, there are many hundreds of them, I have a couple of dozen favorites and I'll run them down to you very quickly. King of the Gypsies, Paul's Cage, Runaway Train, It's My Party, Love is a Gun, Purgatory. Um, uh, uh, what's the one in Jacksonville, Florida? Saved by the Light. Um, and probably three or four others, but those are my first seven. Final Analysis. I always throw that in there. I love that movie. Number eight, Final Analysis. <laughs> Kim Bastner's magnificent in that movie. And in terms of people that you've worked with, like, was there any, because, I mean, particularly, especially given Keaton's role in the music industry as well, and, you know, you've had such long, long careers. Um, is there anyone that you've met, worked with, come into contact with uh, at, at any type of event where you've kind of got really starstruck and thought, bloody hell, that's so-and-so. Star, starstruck only really once, and that was with Sterling Hayden. And I was very starstruck, and he was very kind to me. And he's a very great actor, and we have a great scene together, and we pulled it off together. And uh, it was all improvised because... He doesn't learn lines, and so so it was it was all fine. But uh, uh, as as far as the memories with actors, I have many from Annie Potts in my first movie. She was very good to me, and she was magnificent in this movie, King of the Gypsies. And uh, from Annie Potts to you know, my wife is my favorite actor I ever worked with. But when you say that, it sounds like a marriage thing, but it is. She's my favorite actor in a movie we did called called Love Is a Gun. And she's magnificent in this movie. It's me, her, and Kelly Preston. But uh, I also love working with uh, with Kim Bassinger. Kim was magnificent in this movie, Final Analysis. And uh, and uh, th there have been many actors that I have loved and and uh, and admired working. With. Michael Caine. That was a big deal for us. Yeah, that was cool. Michael Caine. I mean, all through Dark Knight, it was just funny because mm -hmm. you. You'd forget who everybody was because they were just tell them, tell them the story about about craft service. Yeah, and there was one day it really hit us because we were in in the UK and in Chicago, and they were calling it Rory's um, first kiss Rory's because first. it had secret, you know. But all everybody the pages, knew everything was watermarked and the pages were red, so they couldn't be Xerox or faxed. Uh, everybody in Chicago knew when they saw the signs Rory's first kiss. They're like, "Hey, you're doing that, man!" Yeah, like, right. oh, so much for that alias. Yeah. But um, but there was one day we were the whole cast happened to be on that day. So look who you're talking about. It's it's Gary Oldman and Mally, Maggie Gyllenhaal and and you know Aaron Eckert okay. and Christian Bale. Yeah, it's crazy. Heath Ledger. So um, <laughs> where everybody's just sitting in their chairs waiting. We're all there scene. at the same time. Yeah. And we were just going over to craft service. And I turn and say, does anybody want anything? And my wife starts laughing. I said, what's the show? I'll tell you later. And we walk away. Everybody said, no, we're OK. And walk away. And she goes, do you realize you turned and you said to those people who those people were? And you said, does anybody want anything from craft service? <laughs> yeah, because it, it suddenly hits you. So it's kind of real, but not real. It's kind of huge, but nothing at the same time. Yeah. Um, so I mean, that's what being starstruck really is. It's kind of like. You can't wrap your head around it. And then you realize there's nothing really to wrap your head around. But, you know, she noticed it as it was happening. Yeah. And she was enjoying it. And I went, what's up? And she tells me. And then it was just a wonderful little moment we got to share in our lives together. Yeah. There are six superstars sitting there with coffee. It's so great. <laughs> yeah. It, it must just be. That really just sums up the fact that at the end of the day, everybody is human no matter whether they are a massive name or you know still coming up or they don't even want to be a star they don't right. even want to be all of these things that se seem so wonderful and, and glamorous and like that they're, they're huge achievements of course and very difficult but some people yeah. don't want don't want all that but 
Yeah. Those people, Christian Bell, you know, they're, they're human at the end of the day. But that movie, The Dark Knight, I mean, that was, I mean, it was a while ago now, but it's almost the last time I can remember going to a cinema and being like, uh, beyond excited to see the movie because there was so much hype. Was that an, an awesome experience to be involved with? And I mean, do you see, or, presumably you don't see all your movies after you've been in them? Awesome experience. Probably the most awesome movie making experience ever because they told us you're going to shoot all the Chicago stuff in Chicago and then all the England stuff at Pinewood. So we show up ready to go to Pinewood and they say, it's a secret. We're going to shoot it up the old Zeppelin hangar, 30 miles north of, um, of London. And if you're a movie geek, which I am, you walk into the hangar and it's all Gotham City. It blows your mind. It's Hollywood personified, 30 miles north of London. It is so cool. And so we were there for, I was, I was on that shoot for four months of their year shooting. And uh, I'm only in the movie, what, like 15 minutes, <laughs> you know? It was one of those movies. It was a great experience. It is funny though, because you don't expect, I mean, we're there, we're in Chicago. There was one point when Eric had several days off and he had to do a personal appearance in Vegas. And so we just said, you know, can we be flown out and whatever? And they're like, no, no, we don't have it in the budget. No, you stay here, Eliza and Eric, just get yourself a ticket. And, you know, people have no idea that there's still a budget you're adhering to. We were in a tiny room. I mean, you're adhering to all kinds of things like any business where they have to be careful how they spend their money. Right. Mm. And they're careful of all kinds of things, the hours and, and, and what have you. And, um, you know, you do get very quickly to a point where you just you're an employee doing a job. <laughs> and in a way that helps with the sanity even though it's yeah. dark night you're yeah. an employee doing a job even though it's going to be an epic film that wally fitzer shoots beautifully oh my god the visuals of that movie alone are perfect that's an incredible looking movie it's still yeah. a, a job and maybe there's things i mean there was a moment a couple of moments that eric wanted to kind of really play the comedy and chris nolan thought better of it and you know you for, you forget you know I've got I've got a, I've got a quick Costello story for you I'm doing a scene one day and I had this line that I deliver and he said cut and he was way away from me he's way he's like he's like 100 yards away cut Eric don't be funny I said okay <laughs> <laughs> it yeah, is things like that I know but you know something well I found it, it quite funny fun. anyway oh thank you I those, think, see, I, those scenes like all together Yes, I think that that was Chris's vision. He knew he'd get more comedy out of it with absolutely no awareness of the comedy in it. And he, and he turned out to be right. Mm. You know, with the music videos, it's very interesting because in a way we're most starstruck there. And with the Killers, they did the Killers video. Sophie Mueller, who's British, you know, directed. And then- this, She cast me. Right. And then the prequel, Miss Atomic Bomb, which was just Brandon. And, um, and Isabella and Eric, you should watch that one. Um, it was so funny because they call, Eric was in Detroit shooting a movie. I was in LA, they called me. They're like, hey, we're gonna do a prequel. It's a new song of the killers, but the whole band won't be there, but we need Eric. Uh, it's just Eric and Brandon and, and the dancer from the other one. Um, so can you make it? Cause mm. that's the whole thing. We've storyboarded it. And I was like, well, when are you doing it? And they said, tomorrow. I'm like, hold on, aren't you the killers? It's like, don't you have some sense of organization or anything? <laughs> and they're like, oh, by the way, we don't have clothes for him. So can he bring something? <laughs> and I was like, first of all, he's not here. Hit so song, hit band. <laughs> we're going to have to Chaos. bring him in. Isn't that hilarious? We had to, I had to call a friend and beg him to come and double Eric as a photo double from the back. Because of her tenacity, they, <laughs> they, they got that video made. In Eric's clothes. Then I had to FedEx the clothes to him and find a guy who was enough of a fan of Eric's to green screen Eric so they could cut it together. This true was story. So, this you got to watch it. You won't, you won't. Unbelievable. You, you, I yeah. mean, people wouldn't know this stuff, though. No, it's they don't. don't. Guess it. Never. It, it'll all be in the biography. Never. And I <laughs> went to them with the FedEx box and I said, here, can you FedEx the suit so you can shoot Eric? They're like, well, oh, that might cost like $40. I was like, what? Wait a second. What? 
<laughs> it was funny. Aren't you guys doing okay? It was so inside out. It was so I was funny. like, I'll do it. I'll take it to FedEx. You know, I went over to FedEx and just, you know, and then it ends up a video with you know, five billion views or whatever. Yeah. That <laughs> is crazy. yeah, really crazy. That's yeah, I need to. Uh, I've probably seen that video before. I will have watched it anyway. It, but now I need to pay pay attention to it more oh, when I sure. when I watch it. So I've got two final questions for you, which is firstly, given uh, all the industries that we're talking about, music uh, and entertainment industry in general, as I've said, uh, what's the secret to staying sane uh, to maintaining long careers uh, like you have, like Keaton already has, and and undoubtedly will. Uh, and then I will finish off with my final uh, question, which is uh, one that will be uh, slightly off topic. Okay, good. Eric, what's the secret? We can each answer, but you go first. Maybe just you. The secret is a home life away from home. Even if you touch base you know, by phone or by internet, whatever it is, you have to, you have to go in and out of your home. Because if you don't if you don't feel that, you're never going to be comfortable because you know, the road is not made to be comfortable on. So you have to have some place that you have that comfort. And I have that with her. She's my home. And wherever she is is where I live. So wherever she is, if I can, if I can contact that, I'm fine. And I usually drag her with me. That's how we stay married for 20 years. <laughs> so uh, and and we've and we both found that when you travel together you stay together because you know when you're recognizable everybody offers you everything you don't need and uh <laughs> and they offer it to you every single day so and, and you know it's not hard to say no but you learn you have to say no every day <laughs> all day <laughs> i think also um I think that's that, that's really true. And part of what kind of keeps us, first of all, we are not completely sane. So don't expect to actually be or stay sane. So that's first of all, don't have unrealistic expectations. But um, we rescue, our thing is kind of when in doubt, give. And we're part of the Natural Child Pro Project, naturalchild.org. And we also rescue animals. Um, and we, you know, that thing of helping wherever you possibly can with your energy and your time and, and your connections and anything you can do, um, that is real. And that if you can make a difference in someone's life, save a child, you know, save an animal, that's real. So that keeps you right there. And I think that's true for Keaton too. I think also knowing if you're in his position or Eric's who's had to reinvent over and over himself, relaunch, reinvent, you know, you go different distances. My parents were successful, not as successful as they wanted to be. My mom in sitcom, my dad in features. They, they, they are both Emmy Oscar winners, by the way. They are pretty successful. But you have to. Quite a family. Yeah, but you have to realize what you said, Tom. You referred to Keaton as having a long career. I think that that is a wonderful place to go. Oh, wait, I've done this. I've been doing it. I've been earning a living in my field now for my entire adult life since I was a teenager. Um, that's the thing, I'm doing it. And I think to realize you're in for the long haul yeah. and you know that there's a world out there um, way beyond ours, that's probably part of the, the key. Yeah, enjoying the process and realizing there are loads of people that would kill, but I, you know, I know how it is. You always wanna be on the next stage and it's, uh, it's d difficult. Uh, my final question, which is already kind of partly, partially been uh, answered, but it is, uh, how do you have a good marriage? And how do you have a long marriage? Uh, because it seems, and Eric has already uh, alluded to it, that like you guys have a wonderful marriage. Well, my, my, my wife only likes half my answer to this. The other half <laughs> this answer embarrasses her. And she's told me that off camera, she said, don't do that again. I don't like that. And <laughs> I, have to, I have to respect her and I have to lead with that. But there are two things, there are only two things. And it's why I, I can't leave half of them out. Even though she's going to, we're going to go off camera. She's going to say, I told you not to say that. And she's going to do that. <laughs> I'll, I'll say it on camera. But, but here's what it is. <laughs> it's honesty. Because honesty is really hard. And when you really have it all the time, you find it's a wonderful, glorious, enlightening world of kindness when it's totally honest all the time. That and physical intimacy. 
uh, what what we call in America sex. So 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 those two things. When you have those things, you're going to be okay. And that's my answer to how you have a long, happy marriage. Well, thank you for that, Eric. And the uh, celibate uh, portion of the population will uh, be rather dumbfounded after that answer. <laughs> I, don't think I don't think they're too high in number. And maybe they should try a different approach. If you're enjoying the Greatest Music of All Time podcast, you can keep up to date with all of our latest episodes for free by subscribing. If you're watching on YouTube, the subscribe button is located at the top of the Tom Cridlin YouTube page. It's also at the bottom right of any video that you watch on YouTube. If you're listening on an audio platform, such as Spotify or Apple Podcasts, you can subscribe at the top of the page.